All right. So we're going to go. Um, today I'm going to take you through basically this, this approach that we've been using. Uh, mostly we started, of course, in the ocean, but we do a lot of human work also. And this is this, yeah, the annoying overview slide. So the first thing I want to really point out to you guys is that actually uh, viruses are the most important thing out there, and most of those guys are going to be phages. Okay? And all the things that he talked about, about the advances in microbial ecology and, and so forth, were actually done in the viruses first, usually a long time before. And the microbiologists always forget that. <laughs> all right. The other thing that I'm going to introduce is this concept of the holobiont, which is a way that we look at these assemblages and we think about how they're moving. And then I'm going to try to give you a feel of um, how we expect... Uh, how we think about the uh, relationships of the holobiont and how they change when um, we start stressing the thing out. What I really want you to take home is that everything is really individualized out there. And by that, um, it becomes really important when we start thinking about how we're going to uh, manipulate systems. This is how I look at uh, microbial ecology, actually biology in general. So this is mostly what you guys learn when you're in, in uh, college and so forth, right? It's that you have your pri primary producers doing photosynthesis, and then they get eaten by herbivores, and the herbivores get eaten by predators and so forth, okay? And if you think about the microbes at all, you were told that basically they're recycling uh, the waste products out of this. Actually, what's going on out there is that even when it's big things like a plant, at least 50% is probably more like 70 to 80% of the carbon that they fix ends up directly going to the microbes, uh, either through the roots or just being slopped through the, um, the algae and so forth as uh, these products that come out. And in fact, there's actually so much carbon going into this part of the food web okay, that the heterotrophic bacteria are not really energy limited as far as we can tell. Okay. So the reason that we have a million bacteria per mill in the world's oceans, or uh, about 10 to the ninth per gram of soil, is actually because of these predator gills. Okay. And the two predator gills are going to be the protists, which are going along and eating things kind of non-specifically is how we envision it. Probably not true, but that's how we think about it. And then the, the phage um, are going to be blowing them up. Okay. And this, uh, what this does to the global carbon cycle it's still under um, uh, debate, of course, because we really don't have a great fill for it. But the guesstimation is at least 25% of the carbon that's fixed on the uh, uh, planet is actually cycled through the viral shunt. Okay? The rules are, if you're not used to it, that there's 10 phage per, um, or 10 viruses per cell in almost all ecosystems. And there's probably like 10 to the 31 of them there. Our, yeah, sorry about that. It's jumping on me. OK, so the difference between why we think the phage are so important in the way that uh, global carbon cycling works is because of this. So this is a bacteria, and it's been blown apart. And these are all the, this is all its guts sitting out here. And then this is all of the phage sitting there. And this is, if you're not used to them, what the, the three main groups that we know, by morphology at least, the lambda-like, the T7-like and the T4-like phages. Okay. And that's mostly what we observe in the environment uh, if we look with EM. Okay. This is actually most of the time what we're counting. So here's the bacteria cell, and then all these little dots are going to be the uh, viruses. And since we don't actually know that they're viruses in any particular time, we actually call them viral-like particles. Okay. And um, I'll probably use this term microbes, because for the most part, we don't know whether these are archaea or bacteria. Okay. These guys are cycling things really at numbers that we just can't get a hold of, right? So literally, you've just lost 1 to 10 million metric tons of microbes to viral lysis over the last minute or so. Okay? So the rates at which things move through this is really hard. And we're to really dealing with populations that are 10 to the 23rd, 10 to the 24th individuals. Okay? The problem is, of course, that it's actually hard to culture them. Right? And the idea when you're culturing a virus is that what you'll do is culture first the microbe, then you're going to add some sample, and then you're going to hope to see these, uh, the plaques come up, which are the places where all the bacteria or your microbes have been killed. Okay. 
And for anybody that actually knows, has done this, you know how it goes. You try to culture the microbe, it won't grow. You try different conditions, it won't grow. You try praying and sacrificing things, and it won't grow. Then you actually throw undergrads at it, massively parallel undergrads, and eventually you get the microbe. And then you have to start all over again with the same idea to try to get the virus to grow. Okay? And so it's really a pain to um, actually get the, uh, to grow a phage. And this leads to depression. But the honest truth is, as you know, when biologists go and do things, we know that we actually can't grow most things, right? We suck at it. Okay? So if you want to grow something, you talk to someone uh, like a farmer or a, uh, someone in the, uh, at the zoo. What we do is we actually go, we grab a sample, we preserve it, we put it in a museum, and then we go to the bar. Okay? And nowadays, we do a different approach, which is we grab the sample, we grind it up, we sequence the DNA, we put it in the database, and then we go to the bar. Okay? There's actually a third approach that was developed here in Australia, and it's been imported to the US. Okay? So <laughs> really, what you do is you skip all of these unnecessary steps, and you go to the bar. This was pioneered by Jeremy Barr, who's here somewhere in the audience. And you can see he has done a lot to make sure to get rid of the stereotypes that people have of Australians while in the States. So this is what it's going to look like. So this is going to be back in about 2000. Um, and we published it, yeah, 2002. The idea is that what you do is you just um, go grab a whole bunch of seawater, filter out the microbes, throw them away, concentrate the virus-like particles on a filter, and then use a cesium uh, chloride gradient and, a whole, and some nucleases to really purify the viruses, the, the, the DNA that's encapsulated inside a protein shell, and then sequence it. And then, of course, you use these bioinformatics approaches um, to figure out who's there, what they're doing, and uh, what functions they're carrying out. Okay? So this is um, the, uh, the first observation that really came out of this was that basically all of the viral sequences are unknown. And by that, if you do this in seawater, it's 70% of what you see is unknown. Okay? What's remarkable about this is by unknown, I mean it doesn't match anything else in the database by really loose criteria where you're really trying to find something that's linked. The other thing is, is that it's still 70% unknown today. Okay? So sequencing technology has changed about maybe four orders of magnitude since then, right? So we have that much more sequence. The viruses are still this giant unknown. Okay. And it hasn't plateaued. If you do the same thing with bacteria, it actually plateaued a long time ago. So if you go sequence uh, bacteria for the most part, you'll come up with about 10% unknown. And that 10% unknown are actually the viruses that are contaminating your sample. Okay. So this leaves you with this thing that viriomes or viruses respect, uh, represent really this massively uh, large unexplored sequence space. Okay, thing go forward. Okay. The other thing is that you can take home from this. So far as we know, so the ones that you can identify, so maybe 30% of your data, so far these guys are the winners. So these are going to be your lambda-like viruses. Okay. And they seem to be the most common thing that we can at least observe out there. And those will be important because we'll talk about this a little later on. But they're the ones that we usually think as being temperate. The last thing, or the second to last point about all of these studies, is that really viral diversity is, real, is bordering on unfathomable um, at many different levels. So these are way the most diverse things that we've ever seen. Okay? We guesstimate at really the loosest, um, this is just trying to make them group, group together, that there's 100 billion different viral species on the planet. Okay? And we think that they're doing a whole bunch of things, but from the point of view of evolution, that they're actually the uh, major drivers of diversity. And you can basically see this happening in many different ways. The one that, um, that we think about most is basically these red queen uh, dynamics where what you have is you have one strain of uh, bacteria coming up and then a uh, particular phage will come in and kill it and then the next bacteria will come in 
And these bacteria are basically functionally doing the same thing, but you have all this strain diversity driven by the viruses. Okay. The other thing, of course, that they're doing is they're moving in the pieces of DNA um, around. And that's a way of generating a lot of diversity in the system. Okay. The way that um, uh, this works is, in ecology, we would call it kill the winner, or lack of Volterra dynamics. And so that what's that saying is that there's basically predation is keeping things in control. In uh, evolution, we would call these red queen dynamics because what's going on is um, the uh, bacteria are always evolving to uh, get away from the viruses and then the viruses are catching up to them. All right, so how can we take, and the, the introduction did a good job of this, so how can we take all of this stuff and all of this complication and actually really start asking practical things? And this is this personalized medicine idea. And of course, we're starting to get really good at diagnosing new diseases with using these sorts of approaches. And it's not just who's there, but how the disease is working. Okay? And what we're really hoping to find is a chink in the, in the disease ecosystem that we can exploit to treat it. Okay? The other thing that we'll be moving to is uh, actually really individualized treatment. So we'll just take someone when they're sick and we'll say, this is what we need to do with you. Okay? So here's some examples. Here's your teeth, or hopefully not your teeth right now, but you get all the plaque, right? The way to think about this, if you're a microbial ecologist, is that basically what you have is you have the surface of the tooth as well as the gum, and then you have all of this stuff coming by, which is dissolved organic matter, okay? which the bacteria are then eating, and they're growing the, uh, making the biofilms. We also know that there's actually a strong correlation between the plaque that's living on your teeth and, uh, and heart disease. So what, we've been, what we did is um, we were going to look at the bacteria that are living on your teeth, and we're going to try to see if we can make a connection for this. For that, I need, just need to remind you of this part, um, which is basically all viruses, or sorry, the, the viral world in general has two ways that it can make a living. So one is kind of the uh, typical lytic cycle. So the virus is absorbed, they infect the cell, they uh, take over the cellular machinery, make a whole bunch of copies of their genome, make a capsid, and then blow the cell open. Okay. The other thing is, uh, the other thing they can do, of course, is that they can inject their DNA, do the infection, and then actually become part of the cell and replicate with it. And then um, at some point, there will be an induction event and they'll go back into the lytic cycle and you'll get free viruses this way. So you can think of this, this would be influenza and this would be herpes viruses, okay? All right, so same, we're gonna do the same thing on your teeth. We're just gonna go in, scrape off some of the plaque. We're also gonna take some oral pharyngeal stuff, uh, isolate the viruses, sequence the DNA and ask what's going on. When we do this, um, what we find is in healthy people, there's actually a whole bunch of this strep mitis phage SM1. Okay? And this is just really common. This is the genome going across here. This is just uh, different places that we found uh, hits to it and so forth. And what's important about this phage is that this phage actually has modified tail fibers right here, which actually glue its host bacteria, strep mitis, to platelets. So if you get this virus, free virus, you can actually stick things together. Okay. And that is, uh, sucks if you happen to have a heart valve that has an abnormality on it, because actually strep mitis um, and the phage get into the blood, then they find the abnormality on the uh, heart valve and they create a vegetation. And that's what uh, endocarditis is, or one of the main endocarditis is out there. What we found is that these things are really common all over in people, uh, in, uh, actually most healthy people have them. Okay? The other thing is, is we've looked a little bit um, just uh, at what induces them. So we take the uh, strep mitis, the bacteria, incubate it with different things that you would eat or drink, and then look for things that causes the viruses to, do, uh, to jump out. And this is viral counts here. And then the, these are the different things that induce. The classical inducing agents is this uh, mitomycin C, which is just a DNA damaging agent. 
And um, what you can see are things like soy sauce and nicotine can significantly um, cause an induction event. Luckily, red wine does not. Okay? And we've never tested coffee because nobody wants to know the answer to that. Right? That's one of those. So this just shows you that you actually have these things running around. Um, your potential pathogens basically are living on you um, most of the time. Okay? All right, so now we're going to look a little lower in the oral pharyngeal. And um, one of the main jobs of, in my lab is to look at cystic fibrosis. Okay? And basically, this is caused by a mutation, uh, it, a human mutation. So um, what, you, what you have normally in your lungs and um, on your mucosal membranes is you have your cilia and they're moving mucus off. And to keep, allow that to happen, they actually have this uh, liquid layer here, which is maintained uh, probably by a bicarbonate gradient. And they can clear, and we just basically keep clearing our lungs, for example. In cystic fibrosis, the mutation actually changes that, uh, the hydration of that area, and the mucus impacts down on top of the uh, on top of the epithelial cells, and then they get colonized by bacteria. And then, of course, this is kind of the classical one that everybody knows is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at this, and we're going to ask what's going on with the viruses and the bacteria. So when, um, when they do a transplant um, to replace someone's lungs, they pull out the, these are the old lungs, okay? And we get to, uh, uh, we get those, harvest them, and then uh, dissect them, and we're going to look at what's happening in different lobes of this, these lungs. Okay. So the first thing that you can see when you look at this stuff is that the bacteria are actually pretty homogeneous within the same patient, right? So this is one patient, and they have basically kind of this classical Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, phenotype. And this is, and if you look at the bacterial communities, they look about the same in all regions of the lungs that we've investigated. Okay? The second, and in this other one, this is more a Burkholderia, which is uh, also Burkholderia cepatia causes major diseases in cystic fibrosis. It's actually very deadly to them. And in this case, um, what's happened is that uh, Burkholderia has taken over the whole lung and it actually plugged up the trachea and the patient died um, from uh, not able to get any um, uh, air in their lungs. Okay? But there's not much difference in the different places in the lung. Okay? That's the take home message there, as far as when we look at the bacteria, but every patient is different. That's not true with the viruses. So this is the same, this is going to be the explant lung here. And what we have is that th th these are the upper lobes, and then we're going to go down and the, uh, into the right or the left. And what I just want you to notice is that the, di the different colors just represent different viruses. So two things are going on here. First of all, if you like herpes viruses, this is cool because right here in the upper lungs, which are the most uh, clogged up parts of these because of how air moves in the, in the lungs, um, there's basically no phage that we can see in that system. It's almost like the biofilms have stopped the phage from working. And the only thing that we really observe are herpes viruses. The second thing is that as we look through all these, um, we see um, all of these different viral types. And as um, I've talked about a little bit, these phage are actually breaking in all of these different phenotypes that change the bacterial behavior. So even though we see basically the same bacterial backbone, we actually see very different behavior in the metabolisms and so forth that the uh, bacteria can carry out. And it's basically carried on the phage, and of course, there's some plasmids involved. So here's one. This is PF1, and it's um, uh, associated with the mucoidy phenotype of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is uh, one of the ways that it kind of blocks up the lungs, and that's carried by this phage. And then here's, of course, antibiotic resistance is what everybody is usually interested in. And you can see that the antibiotic resistance is actually very different in all parts of the lung. Uh, depending on, uh, and it's carried by the viruses. All right, and then the other thing that you're, we're starting to notice are things like this, is that when you're a CF doctor, you don't actually have any good way of knowing uh, if someone were to have lung cancer, right? Because lung cancer is usually diagnosed as you have problems with your breathing. 
And what we're seeing is things like this, where you have um, places where there are these um, uh, cysts in the, in the lungs. And in many cases, they've got these papillomaviruses. And these would be papillomaviruses that we would associate with um, uh, really cancers associated with the genitals and so forth, right? So we're starting to see things like this. All right, so if everybody's uh, viriomes and microbiomes are individualized, can we actually come up with um, uh, ways to use this data? And how would, we, how would we go about doing it? And the thing we've been um, really looking at is, one, getting really quick data for the clinicians. So that's one thing that um, needs to be developed. So we want to get metagenomic and actually met metabolomic data really quickly within uh, the first 24 hours or so. The other major hang up is the, the data analysis. So I don't know if, you, if you've ever worked with these data sets, they can actually take you uh, years to analyze. So um, we're trying to come up with tools that make this much faster. And then the way that we've been getting around, um, none of this stuff is really validated, right, for doing diagno diagnostic uh, sort of things. So the way that you get around it is that you tell the clinical lab based on what you see in your, um, in your metagenomes to go and do the, the typical culturing and so forth. And this is um, the sort of things that we're building for these things. This is a CF app, and the idea is to put the clinical, metagenomic, and all of the other sorts of data together so that you can, if you actually happen to be a, um, a uh, the doctor, which we have our pet doctor, and what we do is he, he's got his clinical data, and then he can see what the metabolomes, uh, sorry, the metagenomes were telling him, what we predicted for antibiotic resistance from the DNA data versus what we actually see when we look at the um, uh, antibiotics in the lab. All right, so let's keep going. So how do you take all of this horrible di differences that I've been telling you about Okay, and make some sort of rational, uh, rationalization of it and, and really start approaching this. Okay. And the thing that we've been uh, using for a long time is um, this idea of the holobiont. And what these are are basically ecological assemblages um, of the viruses, microbes, fungi, whatever you can um, think of, and how they work together as a unit. The best study one, um, uh, really uh, Nancy Knowlton and I did this at the beginning, where what we were working with um, were, were corals. So corals, of course, are really cool animals. They uh, are hunters, so they have these specialized singing cells, and they build coral reefs. And the animal part depends on this, the zooxanthellae, so the uh, algae that live in the tissue to give it the energy to do the work. But also, living on its surfaces are all these viruses, bacteria, and archaea, as well as the protists that are going to be preying on, upon them. And inside the skeleton, there's all this endolithic algae, as well as these uh, microbial communities that seem to be set up kind of like a sediment column. And the prediction um, at the beginning, what we uh, basically showed is that you can take corals that are right next to each other, and they'll have completely different microbial communities on them. It's different from the water column. But then if you take the same coral species and you look at it a thousand kilometers away, you'll find basically the same microbes on it. And the, um, what we find is that in general, that's actually what um, we find out with essentially everything that we look at, that basically we have these holobionts, these associations between microbes and, um, and macroorganisms that are maintained um, uh, over long distances of, space, of time and space. So that seems to be happening everywhere from corals, which are some of the uh, oldest animals on the planet, to humans. So that's our, uh, our starting point. And what we predict is that these things actually change when we do um, stress, when we stress them. Okay. All right, so I don't have the, can you control this and start? There should be a video associated with this thing right here. All right, so the thing that you guys know about is um, that coral reefs are in decline, and we've been trying to figure out exactly how this is happening. 
This is an example of um, a reef actually kind of in the, uh, this is in Borneo in this case. And what you should see on a coral reef are like literally like hundreds of different species of coral, a whole bunch of fish, and um, almost no algae. Okay. And this is uh, kind of a typical Indo uh, uh, coral triangle sort of reef. Okay. This is actually the same reef a couple of years later. Okay. So what you can see is that they're really actually rapidly losing all of their structure. Um, what you see on the bottom are basically small, uh, they're just basic, uh, they're algae um, mats, um, a lot of cyanobacteria, this is the cyanobacteria, and all of the coral have been killed off. So how do you get something like this to happen this quickly? Okay, switch back to the slideshow. So we've been trying to figure out how the stressors, and the main stressors that we're worried about um, are nutrient additions, which you've all heard of, uh, adding eutrophication, temperature changes associated with um, uh, global climate change, organic matter, because if um, we think, and I'll show you some evidence at this point, that if you add organic matter, um, that's equivalent to if you take away the fish, because there's more, uh, more food for the bacteria. And then decreasing pH, which is also a global uh, uh, stressor. What we're going to do is um, do this uh, on individual corals, and then we're going to go the same thing, use metagenomes to um, isolate, uh, to sequence the viral communities, and just ask what's happening. And this was kind of um, surprising at the time. Um, we found that the temperature, pH, and nutrients uh, stressors all actually increase the coral-associated herpes viruses. And this is just the different viruses. Uh, eukaryotic viruses going along here. This is the similarities um, to them. And you can see it's this increase right here. Okay. So what this looks like is basically the stressors that we get going, um, uh, the same thing that happens to you. Right? So if you have herpes viruses, which you all do, if you get stressed out, you get, they get induced, and that's when you get the lesions. We think the same thing is happening on corals, and that's cool because corals are really ancient animals, so we probably had these viruses from the beginning. We know that, uh, that it's probably an induction event because it can happen very quickly, so these are just different experiments where we're uh, following the herpes viruses over time uh, with real-time PCR. And you can see that the stressor will cause the, the viruses to become, uh, in the, will appear in the free fraction in about the first like uh, 10 hours of stressing. All right, so what happens when we stress a holobion with, um, and look at the bacteria? So we're gonna do the same thing. Corals in there will do the same stressors. We're gonna isolate the microbes away from, uh, the, uh, from everything else sequence them, and then look at the microbiomes. Okay. Can you advance it? Can you advance the slide? It's not going for some reason. Nope. We've lost it. There. <laughs> all right. So what happens in this case is that all of the stressors that we... Um, uh, that we add to the, um, uh, to the corals. So the temperature, DSC, pH, nutrients along this axis here. This is the relative percentage that we get hits to particular taxa. Okay? And we just um, categorize these as things that are uh, thing, bacteria that are associated with diseases and uh, fungi that are associated with diseases. And all four stressors actually cause uh, this increase in pathogen-like uh, microbes and or fungi associated with the corals. Okay. More importantly, because we have a metagenome, we can actually see functionally what's going on. And you can see that in all, in all cases, the number of virulence factors. So these are things that um, uh, have been characterized usually in ma mouse or human mo uh, systems as virulence factors go up in all of the stressors. Okay. What's more in interesting about it isn't just that you see this, um, this switch towards these potential pathogens. It's that every one of 
stressors does it in a different way. So going along here, this is just going to be the relative abundance of uh, particular genes involved in virulence or in the stress responses. Okay. Here's your nutrient treatments, pH, et cetera. And what you can see is that these patterns are different. Also, if we look to see where the virulence factors come from, we'll see things like this, where we don't actually uh, see any evidence of um, vibrios in a healthy coral. Okay? But when we stress the coral out with temperature, we see this uh, increase in the relative numbers of vibrios, and all of the virulence factors that we see coming up are uh, vibrio associated. If we were to look in the pH shock, it wouldn't be the vibrios, it would be bacteroides. Okay? And in fact, everywhere that we do this, we can actually predict what's going on, both in the sense of that we can see um, a disease happening before the macroorganism shows that it's stressed out. So we'll see this switches. And the other thing is, is that we can actually um, tell you why the disease is hap happening. Often, the things that you uh, associate with a particular disease are not actually the causes. We see the causes come up earlier, and then we see the secondary infections effectively. Okay. To give you a feel of how predictive these things are, is that 70% of the variance is explained by basically only two axes both for both the, uh, the microbiomes and the virions, if you look at it at the functional level. Okay. If you did the same thing with 16 S's, you'd get a number like maybe 10%. Right? So these are extremely predict uh, powerful of predicting things. And we've used it basically from aquaculture and humans to coral reefs. So it's a very generalizable approach to looking at this. So let's look at a coral reef and kind of think about how we go answering that question of why coral reefs are falling apart. Okay. So on a healthy coral reef, mostly what you have are corals and coral and crustose algae. These are uh, the main reef builders on the, on the, uh, on the coral reef. Um, and then you have the different types of uh, uh, macroalgae and turfs also living there. But usually you don't see much of these on a healthy reef. Okay? What that means is that um, the amount of food that's available to the bacteria is actually controlled by the surface. So the corals feed a specific like microbiota. That's why we get that uh, result. And they keep the microbes in control by supplying a particular type of DOC to them. Okay. The reason that this is going on, we think, is because these bigger macroalgae and turf algaes are always grazed down on a healthy system. And as they're grazed, they get eaten by bigger and bigger things. And most of your energy goes up to what we would call the shark shunt in this case. If we go to the main thing that we do to a reef, which is overfish it, so uh, what happens is that you start to, you get in this uh, positive feedback loop, which is bad, where, well, which actually can cause that really rapid decline, where the corals um, start to lose to the turf algaes in particular, who are feeding the bacteria directly, dissolved organic matter, and then that causes the microbes to grow, which cause disease on the corals, which creates more space for the turfs. And you get in this positive feedback. And we call this the dam cycle. And basically, the predictions are that we'll find more potential pathogens, which we do like on uh, really large scales. And the other one is that we expect to see basically an increase in coral algal interaction zones, which I'll show you why that matters. Okay. So the idea is you can imagine if you're fighting um, on space for, uh, on a coral reef on the benthos, if you're a coral this big, you have a certain uh, radius, okay? which means that you get all this surface area to fight at this perimeter. Okay? And this is gonna, the area is going to increase as a square where the uh, perimeter is basically uh, increasing linearly as a linear function. So what happens is then as you lose um, area, you have less area feeding the circumference. So what's going on on these interaction zones? And this is just um, us going out in the field. And the first thing that we're going to do is just lay down transect tapes um, across a coral reef. And then we're going to count every coral going along this. And then we're going to estimate uh, the amount of interactions with algae, what types of algae, et cetera. Okay. If you do this um, 
you get really good at just telling, here's where a coral is walking over the top of an algae, right? Here's where the coral and the algae are neutral, so they're growing right next to each other. And here is where an algae is um, basically attacking over the top of a coral. You take hundreds of sites all over the world, and what we come up with that is that corals are losing basically wherever there are turf algae, and wherever that happens is where we have people. Okay? And the reason is, is because we're removing all of those grazers that would normally be keeping them in, uh, uh, in, ta or in check. All right, so what's going on there from the microbiology point of view? So here's an EM, an SEM of the, uh, this would be a coral. There would be algae here. This is the interaction zone with the coral. And what you've got is this um, uh, zone right here where you have all the microbes piled up against the coral. Okay. So this is what we're interested in. Okay. And we've basically reconstructed it in the lab where what we're doing is we've put just the coral across from a piece of algae. And between them, we put a barrier filter that only lets dissolved things go across. Okay. So no, no viruses, no bacteria moving directly. And if we do that, what we find is that a coral by itself is completely happy. A coral across from the algae always dies. Okay? And a coral across from an algae plus an antibiotic always lives. Right? So it tells you that one, if you put the corals and algae next to each other, the corals are in trouble. And two, that um, there's a microbial component. Okay? The other um, thing that we know is that if we look across this, what we'll find is that the coral across from the algae um, has these hypoxic zones. So this is just dissolved oxygen along here, and it's, we're looking right here, and you can see these hypoxic zones. If you add antibiotics, you relieve that, and you don't have the hypoxia. So our model is, is that basically the algae is feeding the bacteria that live on the corals, and that's causing them to suffocate. There, oops, let's go back. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So this is another way of looking at this. So we're gonna visualize this with things called um, uh, uh, planar optodes. So there's what you see here, where it's green, that's where we have oxygen. Where it's red is where we have very low oxygen concentrations. Here's the algae next to the coral, and right where these two are talking to each other is where we see the hypoxia. Okay? And it differs, of course, during the daytime, it's more localized to this area. During the nighttime, actually, the corals stop um, uh, uh, photosynthesizing, and you see more hypoxia over the, the coral. And we could start to even ask, is the animal stressed? We have a number of ways of looking at that, but in this case, we're just gonna use a green fluorescence protein because we can do that in the field. So corals, of course, naturally have green fluorescent protein. And so we're gonna look at um, this, just take pictures underwater, and we're just gonna ask, um, do we have more GFP along the edges compared to the middle? Okay. And we know from pre previous studies that changing GFP uh, levels means that the coral is stressed. Okay. And we see this uh, good evidence of this, that basically when you've got a um, coral next to a turf algae, it's got a lot less GFP in that perimeter area as compared to its middle. That suggests that the coral is filling the stress, and that's our working model at the moment. So if you put all this together, we think that um, algae basically cause hypoxic zones that are dependent on microbial activity to maintain. We know that we can block them with antibiotics. We think the mechanism is dissolved organic matter released from coral, I mean from the algae, which we uh, have proven in a lot of different ways. And that we know that the coral is a animal is stressed along those uh, interfaces. Okay. So I'm gonna show you one more version of this, and this is, um, looking at scaling up a little bit more back to this reef. So even if you have this very intact system where you've got lots of grazers and you're uh, drawing energy away from there, we do know that sometimes nutrient additions can kill a coral reef. And the model is, is that nutrients will fe feed the turf algae, which then will produce more photosynthate, which will feed the microbes, and you'll get back into that down model again. 
And we're kind of lucky or unlucky depending on how you want to look at it. So these are the line islands where we do most of our work. And these guys um, are out here in the middle of nowhere, uh, about 1,000 um, miles below Hawaii. And they exist in these areas where there's essentially no iron in the ocean. Okay? And that's because you depend on iron being uh, coming in from land. These are also plat carbonate platforms. So these are these classical coral reefs where everything has been built, the, the land is sank um, down and the corals have been building up, kind of what Darwin was talking about. And um, these things um, literally have no emergent land um, at all. So there's really no iron uh, uh, in these areas. Okay? And what happens, of course, is that uh, ships run into them because they're sticking out of the ocean. And what we see in this part of the world is every place where a ship runs into, a coral, into the, these coral reefs, it becomes blocked. Okay? This is what we call them. And all of the coral is dead there, and the whole bottom is covered with algae. Okay? The water becomes very cloudy. You can see it really well here. Okay? And these are just reference reefs, which should be very, this is how they should look in this part of the world. Okay? And these things are amazingly uh, uh, Problematic. So this is one on uh, one of the American reefs. It's actually killed a kilometer of the coral reef um, has been killed off by this one very small shipwreck. This is to give you another view. So this is Millennium, which is one of the world's most beautiful atolls. And you've got basic, you know, coral cover here will be like 50% all the way around the coral, uh, around the reef. And then when you get to where the shipwreck is, it's completely dead in that area. And what we found is that using a whole bunch of different um, uh, approaches, but um, just to look at what sorts of uh, uh, elements you have there and so forth, what you see is that on the block reef sites, you have elevated iron compared to control sites. All right. The other thing that we know is that if we go in and we, skip and we do those uh, analysis where we grab all of the uh, bacteria and then we're going to sequence them um, uh, with metagenomes, we see this increased virulence factors associated with the black reef sites um, and only the black reef sites. Okay? And these virulence factors are exactly the same ones that you would have in um, your blood when uh, bacteria gets inside your blood. So they're things that are all about scavenging iron. And that seems to be the common theme here in those guys. Okay? And this is kind of the kicker. So here is an example of now we have a coral. Um, these are little bits of coral, and we're going to put them in these little bottles, and we're going to add a little bit of iron. And if you put add uh, iron and corals, they actually don't care. They're actually probably a little bit healthier because they're, uh, they seem to be often iron limited. Okay? If we add a little bit of, uh, if we add the coral nubbins plus some rubble from the site, we're kind of trying to inoculate them with the bacteria. What we'll see is that all of the um, uh, the corals, for the most part, live. Uh, there's a little bit of death, but not a lot. Okay? However, if we take coral and we add rubble and then we add iron, all of the corals die. Okay? And if we add coral, rubble, iron, and, and an antibiotic, all of the corals live. Okay? What's uh, interesting, and we don't understand the chemistry of this, is that if we do this experiment, we actually get that black precipitate falling out of solution, which is not iron, it's sulfur. Okay? And this is somehow driven by the microbial activity. Okay. So what we think is going on when we look at these um, coral reefs is that, or these black reefs, is that we've basically got these microbial mats that are crawling along using the, the iron that's coming off the, um, off the shipwrecks, and they're taking over the coral, and they're just marching along the bottom. Where we have old ones, so we have one that's about 40 years old, the only thing that seems to have stopped it is actually physical barriers. So there's a place where um, on the north it gets scoured by the waves, so that the, this black reef doesn't seem to be able to advance. And then on the south, it's actually blocked by this lagoonal uh, exit. So we don't seem to be able to, uh, they can't move past that. I have to tell you that these are really small amounts of iron that are doing this. So it has to be something about the microbial activity keeping them in there. And we think it's a dam mechanism, again, where basically the corals are uh, 
the, the algae are feeding the bacteria, which allows them to walk over the top of the reef. All right, so this actually uh, brings me to the last point here, is that it act this does work, okay? So good data turns out to um, tell you, to um, allow you to make changes. So what we did in this case is we took this, these results here and we went to the Bush administration, which wouldn't be your best uh, place to go looking for money to get rid of the shipwrecks that are occurring on this. And they were convinced enough to go out and start removing these wrecks. So we're getting them off. So now we've got a stressor. We're going to remove the stressor and we're going to see, does it go back to the state that we were at before? Okay. With that, I'll thank a whole bunch of people because of course this is gigantic efforts. This is my lab in San Diego. Um, there's a lot of us. We do uh, the corals, the microbes, and a lot of um, uh, things associated with human biology. All of my math stuff is done by this group here. To do the work out at the open oceans, we usually work with NOAA as well as a group at Scripps. Um, Anka helps with the, all of the genetics and so forth. Mark builds all the fun things. Um, Maya Breitbart started the metagenomics um, back in the early 2000s. Liz Dinsdale helps with a lot of the coral reef stuff. Becky Thurber did the herpes virus story I showed you. Um, and Rob Edwards is the person that does most of my bioinformatics. To get to the middle of the ocean takes a lot of work. And um, it's actually these four people right here um, at Scripps and at, the, uh, at National Geographic to get us out there. And then these are the people that pay for it. And with that, I'll take questions. Does that sound good?